Welcome ladies and gentlemen, this is a screencast for genetic engineering notes for Ms. Cyrus CP biology class. We're going to start today, this is video one of four on selective breeding. Um, the pre-reading you need for this section is section 15.1 in the Pearson textbook, so make sure you have that read beforehand. If you ever need to access it again, you can click down here for the screencast, it's located in the Google slide production. So let's get going for today. I'd like to start out with actually a story that I experienced a couple weeks ago. I went to visit my friend's puppies, and she bred these puppies that are so adorable um, that you can see in the picture here. One thing I want you to notice about the puppies is that they are all Weimaraner puppies, and these puppies are bred for their wonderful personality. Down here in the bottom, this is their mother. Her name is Gracie. She's adorable, and she is an excellent farm dog in that she has a good personality for it. She sticks around, and she's good at catching little rats and varmints that run around the, the farmyard. Um, the other thing you should notice is that Gracie is actually a slightly different color than the puppies. She's actually a light brown, whereas the puppies are a light gray. Turns out, light gray puppies I think you can sell for more money. So here we're faced with an interesting dilemma. My friend wanted to have a litter of puppies that had Gracie's good personality, great farming abilities, but she wanted a different color, different than Gracie's color. So what she went out and did, she found another farm that had a gray Weimaraner and she chose to breed Gracie to this gray Weimaraner. And the result is they ended up with puppies with the best of both, both worlds. They ended up with puppies with good personality and puppies with the light gray trait. You might say, why are we talking about this example if we are talking about genetic engineering in this video? And that is because this is actually an example of genetic engineering. This might be a little surprising because most people think that in genetic engineering it involves test tubes and beakers and restriction enzymes and recombinant DNA. But in reality, the easiest type of genetic engineering, we have examples about all around us in our daily lives. And that is simply things that we choose to breed together to try to get desired outcomes. And that is the example of Gracie and her puppies. So what is selective breeding then? So what's some other examples that we have of selective breeding? Selective breeding is anytime humans cross parents with desired traits to produce offspring with those same desired traits. So for example, we might try to get a specific color of flower, or we might try to get disease resistance to be um, integrated into a crop that we're growing, or maybe we want increased milk productions in our cows. So we can breed different organisms together to try to get those desired traits. Some examples of this are in dogs. A lot of times we try to mash up dogs and create these weird, crazy combination of breeds like a puggle or a labradoodle. Um, and that's us selecting traits that we want, putting them together and hoping that the offspring have those traits. So we get that in dogs and cats and farm animals, um, in different crops that we grow. For example, racehorses. We are constantly selective breeding racehorses so that we can try to get a faster organism. So there are two types of selective breeding that you should be familiar with. The first is called hybridization. Kind of sounds like a hybrid, right? Gets me thinking of hybridized cars, like a Prius or something that runs on gasoline motors and on batteries. But the word hybrid actually means when you bring two different things together, when you hybridize something. So it's similar to a Prius or some type of hybrid car in that a hybrid car brings together a gas motor and a battery. But this is going to be a little bit different. When you hybridize um, during selective breeding, it means you're crossing different individuals and you are hoping to get the best traits of both of those organisms. So you're taking two different beginning parents and you're hoping that the offspring has a combination of the best traits of both parents. Hybridization, a great example of that is like disease resistance within food producing capacity. So um, we might choose one one breed of corn that you eat that has a really good resistance to a specific type of aphid. But we might try to breed that corn with another type of corn that actually produces a higher yield of that plant. So it has more corn kernels and thus we can get more money from the product if we, if we breed it together as farmers. So if we hybridize these two strains together, we get the best of both worlds, and that's hybridization. We do this with dogs. So like I said, getting a puggle or a labradoodle or any of those cross species. We also do this with plants. So you might have heard of Broca flower or maybe a grapple, which is a cross between a grape and an apple or even a changello or any of those weird freaky fruits that you see in the, the fruit aisle. We're trying to get the best of both, both worlds in those fruits. Now the opposite of hybridization is going to be inbreeding. 
And you might have heard of inbreeding as, you know, sisters marrying cousins and first cousins and brothers marrying other sisters. And it's not exactly that type of inbreeding. But the idea is similar in that we are crossing similar individuals. So what that means is that for hybridization, we are trying to get a new trait from two different individuals. Inbreeding, we found something that we like in a breed and we want to try to maintain that desired trait. So we're gonna cross similar individuals and we're gonna hope that we maintain that desired trait in the next generation. So that would be, for example, if I have a really fast racehorse and I want to breed it with another really fast racehorse, we're hoping that the resulting offspring will also be a really fast racehorse. So we're trying to maintain those desired traits by breeding similar individuals. So other examples are things like dogs, which is why purebred dogs are so common, that you want the traits of a Labrador retriever or you want the traits of a golden retriever. So you breed two golden retrievers together and you get a purebred inbred dog. Same thing with cows and crops. Okay. Now what this means is that genetically the individuals that are inbred are going to have more similar genetic information. This is good in that you're getting those maintained desired traits, but it's bad in that if you cross two heterozygous individuals together and they have the same trait, you have an increased chance of getting two recessive alleles. So sometimes inbreeding is associated with a higher frequency of recessive genetic disorders. Okay. This defect can result in um, dogs. A lot of times blindness is more common in purebred dogs. There's a leg de uh, deformality called um, hip degeneration, which is associated with purebred dogs, and also just an increase of general recessive diseases. So pros and cons to both of these different types of selective breeding. Here's another example. Um, here we're starting up here um, in this cull. This is a group of fish, and we are assuming that we want this group of fish, um, we want the desired traits of a really darker fish. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our entire population and we're going to select out um, the traits that we do not want. So we're going to select out the white fish and we're going to select out the dappled fish, which have this, this pattern here for this one and this one and this one. So if we um, get rid of these fish and we only save these gray striped fish that we want and we breed one gray striped fish to another gray striped fish, we are selecting the population so that it will be inbred, it will breed true breeding just gray striped fish. All right, so that's selective breeding, this would be inbred. Now, the other thing that breeders can do is we can actually increase variation, and variation is a very, very, very good thing in biology. Um, the way that we do that is we actually use these things called mutagens. All right, mutagens to cause mutations. So a mutation is the ultimate source of genetic variation in that a mutation is when we scramble up the DNA and we make new genes and new traits in different orders or maybe we just mix up some different alleles or different ways that those traits are expressed. Um, some mutations are good. So not all mutations are bad and we learned that before. Some mutations make new unique desired traits. All right, so for example, some chemi or some biologists will actually expose, um, expose different organisms to chemicals and radiation. Sounds bad, causes mutation, but sometimes that mutation yields an actual beneficial trait. For example, um, there was a strain of bacteria that were exposed to extreme, I'm sorry, that were exposed to extreme amounts of radiation. And as they were exposed to radiation, they exhibited mutations. Now, it sounds like that's awful, but what resulted is that these bacteria actually had a couple mutations that allowed them to eat and metabolize oil. And you might think that's gross, but in the case of a huge tanker of oil that is going across the um, Gulf of Mexico, if it should, I don't know, maybe spill, kind of like the one that BP did, um, then this oil eating bacteria would be hugely beneficial. So this did actually happen where scientists were able to mutate bacteria to make them eat oil. And it's, help, it's part of what has helped us clean up the ocean water after large oil spills, so that's great. Um, another example of this is that we can actually expose plants to radiation and chemicals to make them what's called polyploid, 
which means that they are going to have multi or multiple different copies of their chromosomes. So we just learned that diploid means you have two copies, haploid means you have one copy, polyploid means you have many copies. And this actually results in plants being larger and stronger. So we've used this type of mutation or this mutagen to actually help make polyploid plants, oil-eating bacteria, and several other organisms that have been beneficial to us and to the ecosystem. So this has been Genetic Variation. Stay tuned for um, video number two that will be on, here we go, Manipulating DNA. Thanks, guys.